Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I, this is actually a episode I've been wanting to do for a long time because we actually have someone here. Because so many people say to me, uh, what can we do to establish a village? What can we do to establish a village? So we have, alhamdulillah, someone here who is somewhat of uh, an, a qualified person to talk about the subject. And not someone. I mean, this is what he, he does. And, and this is Brother Muhammad Bose. Um, he has his journey to Islam, which we'll touch upon a little bit today. And then we'll talk about what are the, uh, how do we establish a Muslim village? And maybe we can talk about that. And Brother Muhammad Bose, I don't know if you want to talk, because people have asked me the question of what do, we, what do I do if I can't be in a Muslim village? And maybe that's, a, I guess, maybe an important question too. But today I would like to deal mostly with how to establish a Muslim village. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then if we have time, we'll see where things go. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, Brother uh, Muhammad Fos, tell us about your journey to Islam. Uh, okay, well, um, I'm, I'm just turned 57 now, uh, as you can see with the white beard. But um, uh, by profession, I'm a wildlife biologist and, and specialize more into birds of prey, hawks and falcons, and then I specialize further into the study of um, vultures. And uh, previous to accepting Islam, I was studying, I, I wasn't too far away from becoming a Baptist uh, minister here in the UK. Mashallah. Okay. And, and uh, for me, the Bible wasn't making sense. And um, I got invited by the Saudi Arabian Wildlife Department to go over to research a species of vulture called the Eurasian griffin in the southwest mountains down near Yemen. And um, so I went over there uh, and I was there for about three years. It was all paid for. And um, I was to and fro in. And uh, the colony of birds I was working on was 8,000 feet up, so way, way above the clouds. Mm. Um, and not realizing when I reflect how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was be beginning to work on me that on the last journey and my research is still not completed. I've done a Hajj, Alhamdulillah, I've done Umrah, but I've tried a few times to complete my paper, but I just can't get back. Um, mm. And uh, I, for a number of years, I heard the call of the prayer, but I had in a small apartment 8,000 feet up in the mountains and for about three days before Fajr, I heard the call of the prayer echoing in the mountains. So it was very much a spiritual journey. And I just used to lay in my bed crying, mm. crying, thinking, and I was communicating whoever was calling the prayer. I'm not sure what you're saying to me, uh, but don't stop. And then I, um, at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, um, working on a, an, a, a, an, an Egyptian man that used to climb the mountain to offer me food. And I asked him one day, just out of interest, where could I get a, a Quran in English? And he said, go to the shopkeeper in the village. Hmm. That's where you need to go. And I knew him for about three or four years. And um, I went to him and he said, okay. And then about two days after that, before I was due to drive back to Taif and then London. Um, I met a Arab brother called Khalid. He was an English teacher, and he gave me a, a Quran in English. And then he said to me, "Where did you hear the prayer? The call of the prayer?" I said, "In the mountains." And he said, "Were you aware that there was a masjid behind your accommodation?" I said, "No." So he said, "You're going back tomorrow. Would you come for Vajra?" So I've never been inside a masjid, and I went with him. I was tense. I was nervous. And after Fajr, he just turned to me, he said, do you want to become Muslim? And I just said, yes. I'd done the Shahada. They all ran out into the street. They went to the mayor's office and said, no, at that time I was known as Martin. Oh, the Englishman has become Muslim. Yeah. And, and, you know, so they wanted me to stay there. But then I had to drive back. And when I drove back, all the Arabs were there and they were there to meet me. And Alhamdulillah, my supervisor, Dr. Mohammed Shobrak, he said to me, okay, how long have we got? He said, you've got two days left before you go back to London. Come with me. So he took me into the desert to spend 
uh, one night with the uh, Bedouins. And mm. in that period of time, I learned my Salah, I changed my name, I learned how to make ablution. Mm. Um, and that was just amazing. And then he said, okay, you said we've got one day left. So now I'm going to take you to Mecca to do all, uh, to do all, uh, Umrah. I mean, Alhamdulillah, this is only my third day after accepting the Shahada. Mm. And then I had that Malcolm X experience. When I first saw the Kaaba, mm. he said to me, Muhammad, what do you see? And I saw thousands of people. And I said, I'm seeing thousands of people. He said, use your eyes. What do you see? Mm. Then I said, now I see brothers and sisters. I see black people, white people, brown people. He said, yeah, this is your, your new family. Mm. And I flew back to London and I had that thirst, desire to study. And I went to the scholars and um, I did have a place to go to study in Egypt. But then they said to me uh, here in my location, do you really want to study? <coughs> and they knew that I was a biologist. And I said, yes. And they said, will you enable us to guide you? I said, yes. So they said, we'll send you to a Darulum in South Africa. Mm. in Azadville. So I couldn't work out why South Africa. So Alhamdulillah, I, I went there and um, uh, met my wife in Kenya. Then we went down there. Uh, she studied the Alima course. Oh. Um, and so, you I mean, obviously, uh, this time I was the age 40. Mm. So I was the grandfather of the whole of the uh, Dalalum, over 600 students. Mm. And... Um, I went there basically with Alif Bata. Uh, and so the scholars said, you know, we'll put you on the Imam Khatib course for nearly four years, nearly four, four years. And I graduated there in 2006. I came back to the UK. I worked for a couple of Dawa centers. And then family said they were advertising for Imams in the prison service. So um, I applied and I started part time, went full time. Uh, I'm now the the head imam, and now I'm the head of the whole of the multi-faith uh, chaplaincy. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, my wife's now in her final year of Alima, and I'm in my third year now of the Alim course here in the UK. Uh, okay, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, mashallah, Allahu Akbar. That's awesome. Okay, so Sheikh Muhammad uh, Fawz, uh, how do we... Um, what are, what are the things that, you know, l let me just take myself as an example. We have a strong, committed, somewhat mature community, and we are uh, looking for land uh, where we can, um, you know, fortify ourselves if there's a need uh, to do that. And so what are the things that someone, uh, what are your advice to somebody that's like, okay, you know, I think I have about, 10 years give and take before things get really bad. So what are the things I need to take into consideration? I think that the first thing you need to decide and some of the arguments are is, is are you, you know, depending on your number, are you prepared to live totally as a community off grid or are you going to purchase the land uh, and then still live in the towns and in, in the actual cities and then, then commute to the the land um, daily. I think that's that's what you need to do first of all, and then establish what skills mindsets do you you, you know you all have, uh, yeah. and you know those you might have some brothers and sisters who already got a good skill set, or if you haven't, where do you go? Now we're fortunate here in the UK because we have animal care colleges and they do courses on beekeeping and uh, sheep rearing, uh, quail farming, uh, you know, so you can, you can go on these courses, six week, eight week, one year courses to give you that skill because over here, many, many people are, are, are now moving off, off grid. Hmm. Um, so, you know, these and same thing in the US, the, the Christian community here, and even some of the atheists, they, 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 they've been, you know, they call them the doomsday preppers. 
they've been getting ready for a long time. We're actually behind in, in, in that. Uh, yeah. And, you know, why, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we tap into them? You know, if, if they're offering courses uh, uh, and, uh, you know, why, why shouldn't we go to them? Hmm. You know, we, we don't have to explain why, you know, what is the, the actual bigger picture, but we can go and learn from them. And the areas that we need to know, apart from basic animal and uh, looking after the farm or the land, basic husbandry and your water supply and your, how you're going to get electricity, etc., is you can sustain yourself with looking for vegetables, your fruit, beekeeping, chickens, quail, a small quail production um and livestock you know from goats uh to uh, sheep you mm. can sustain yourself and also sell that produce so you're 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 feeding the community but you're also it's producing selling. extra mm. so you can sell i mean just from bees uh you know beekeeping so you know you can i mean people even in america become professional bee farmers so you could i mean over here if you had say 20 hives your class as a professional bee farmer mm -hmm. and so from that you've got your honey production and then from that you can make a business you know you, you, you can be a queens you can make propolis you can uh, sell your beeswax and make candles uh mm -hmm. and so you know you can get a good regular income and then sell your honey to the you know the wider community because so many people now want pure pure honey but the, the, the honey you're buying in your supermarket is not pure hmm. it's all mixed um so you know once you've sat down and you've worked out what you want to do do you want to actually move off grid totally as a community that was the idea that i had in my mind was to become completely self-sufficient so uh, that's what we we wanted to actually become self-sufficient around the masjid and then have another place outside the masjid where we're also self-sufficient so we would have a place where we know where we all can meet so to say and then from there go to this land that's been prepared uh yeah, yeah. so th that's the the idea that's a bit you know um uh, just keep it very sort of simple you then um again you know uh okay so if you're going to live there you know do you need everyone to, to to be involved in the actual farming maybe not because obviously depending on each particular family's background they still might have to go back into the cities or whatever but as long as you've got the key people that, that are trained in that skill mindset to be able to keep that farm uh, going mm -hmm. To provide for the family, and then to um, you know sell that additional uh, produce, and uh, and what's happening over here as well is once you've got an established site, is then you open it up to teach the others, so they also come on board. Right, 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 right. That's important. I got yeah. that. Yeah. So now, uh, what are uh, what are the key things? we need do we need to be self-sufficient you mentioned the bees uh i guess goats um hens we we are making a, a poultry um you know where chickens a chicken coop uh around our masjid because uh by city standards we're allowed to have x amount i think it's like five per family or something in in, in this we're actually in the ghettos, so we have. Uh, we're not like in the city. City. We're like in the in the in the. It's actually it used to be a lot of uh, crime, but there's no longer a lot of crime because Muslims have moved in, so that's mostly gone away. Not completely, but mostly gone away. And uh, you know we've established a perimeter on which we have a strong, you can say, security surveillance cameras. We have enough cameras that the cops come to us and say, you know, we need footage of what was happening in the neighborhood. And, and, and so uh, 
we have, you know, we have that chicken coop I was telling you about. We have a, a, a green, like, uh, crops we're growing. And uh, the brother that's helping us, he's a Native American. Okay. Uh, and he's like the medicine man of the, the, the natives. And so he's, he's very good at what he does. Um, so now we're doing here uh, to, to see, okay, what we can do here, because we still want to do that well. We still want to help people to Islam. We want to kind of like uh, build the skills also, right? And then we're also looking for land uh, somewhere where if we cannot protect ourselves in the city, then we have somewhere to go outside the city. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very clear about some of the security aspects. Um, but I think we can use a lot of help on what will, like, for example, what, what do we exactly need to be self-sufficient in, let's say, a village of, you know, uh, of, let's say, 50 people, 100 people, 150 people. Um, like, uh, I was talking to one farmer, and the farmer was like, oh, one cow is enough for one family. Kind of like, mm -hmm. you need one acre of land. For one cow and then that one cow will eat that one acre and and it'll like keep growing you know considering everything is normal um and then and then he'll produce milk for one family so if you have 50 families 50 acres uh, you know 100 families 100 acres uh, that's what he said i don't know right um so in that sense what guidance would you give to us um yes i mean i i agree with that as well so you know one one family you can have between five and ten chickens uh one to one to three goats one cow um uh, and the other area to think about as well if you you know to try and sustain yourself it's not just chickens as well because if you're thinking about okay so you need to make an income to, to, to put back into into the for the fam for the uh, family in community um but to reach out to the wider community is uh, an area that people don't think about much um which, somebody which, might come to the farm and they're starving right and yeah, then yeah. you can't you don't want to necessarily sacrifice what you made for yourselves you have to have something extra yeah because uh, i'm thinking people will come when they're in dire situation and they'll be like okay you know just uh give us a land and, and, and we'll do our thing too. Uh, and so what is it that we're, we need to do to establish it? And what is the cost for, let's say, one family to be self-sufficient? I reckon to establish a small holding, what we call is a, a small holding, just from a UK perspective, I reckon you could set up something in the countryside um, and I know property is around here for about 70, 80,000. That's in pounds. 80,000 pounds. So that's like uh, $160,000. Yeah. 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 That's with a, a small holding. So that's with a small house sheds and then quite a large part of land. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that would get you, let's say, goats or chickens and... and, and yes, yeah. I and think a bell would be very important, right? Uh, yeah. Is what I yeah. Was thinking, one of the things that... Uh, and another area, if you want to make quick money and people don't think about it, is quail farming. Quail farming, okay. I'll yeah. keep that in mind. So if you look at a normal time of incubation for a hen egg, so a quail egg would hatch in about 12 to 14 days. Mm. So, you know, the, the restaurant market, the big markets that, you know, quail, whether it's the, the meat or the eggs and your local butchers, there's a big demand for quails. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, if you're just thinking of, you know, you, you need to make profit as well. Uh, you can talk about an incubator uh, and quails are very small. So again, the turnover is is quicker. You've got your meat and you've got your eggs, and you can make quick uh, 
money as well. Yes. So yeah. uh, could a bunch of families put in, uh, let's say, $150,000 worth of money to, and then it, after that, it's not that expensive? So let's say instead of one family, it's two families. Can they do it for like 180000 Yes, easily. Easily. Okay. Easy. Easy. So uh, Muslims have to get uh, one person who can put in, or a few, let's say, what about... 10 families with an average of three people, let's say. Now, would it be ex 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 substantially more or are we still looking at 150 plus, let's say 10,000 per family? We've got a hundred, yeah, 150, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so it's doable is what you're saying. Yes, yes, I mean, if you, you know, uh, if you can get that land, if you can get that land. Now, does the land have to have water in it beforehand or it doesn't have to have water in it? It have to have land. But obviously you need to do all your investigations before, but um, uh, if it has the land and the irrigation is there, then you no, know, or if not, then you just need that skill and mindset to, to put all the uh, systems in place, not just for the water, but for the heating and, and also the actual waste. Hmm. The so, waste. Oh, yeah, so, point. yeah. So it's not just the waste from the human side, it's the waste from the animal side. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although a, a lot of that waste, which is coming from them, is obviously going to be recycled back onto the land. So we're talking about as a, an eco farm being totally, um, well, depends. I mean, if you're talking about organic farming, are you talking about organic free from chemicals and pesticides? Or and what, is your your, what is your best opinion on that? Uh, so let's say uh, we've moved over there and now we're in a position where there's anarchy in the city and it's all collapsed for the most part. Or let's say now the gel comes and sets up a new system in these cities. Hmm. It's very interesting that you mentioned about going into the city to buy and sell. Because the Ashab al-Kahf, the seven sleepers, when they were in the cave, they also had to go into the city to purchase their food. And it was said, to, this is actually the, the, the middle word of the whole Quran. Be careful. Okay. <laughs> And let not anyone become aware of who you are. Mm. So uh, anyway, so I just found that interesting because I never, I you know, I was thinking more from the perspective that okay, when we go to the village, we're there, and then that's it. Mm. But now, when you said and and you kept emphasizing commerce, commerce. Well, if you want sustainability, you have to have commerce, right? And if yeah, you because he, 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 even the farmers here, and and obviously the farmers in your country will, you know, they are struggling. So some are having to move away from that normal farming. They're having to open up to what we call our adventure weekends and, you know, open up their farms for camping that they're, they're having to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like some of them over here, they allow you to do hunting. Uh, some of them allow, you know, different things. Uh, they'll also sell, uh, sometimes right on the street, uh, some of their produce. Um, because what's happening is uh, the small farmers are getting crushed in America. Yes. And, uh, and you only get money uh, in America with farmers if you, if you follow the regulations and use the specific pesticides that they want you to use and, you know, all these other uh, requirements that they've put down um, that, that, that or they say okay like i know one farmer in 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 maryland uh he was like well you know we used to uh, give milk to one of these big milking companies but we can't keep up with the demand and if we don't keep up with the demand that they want they don't want us you know so it's like do or die situation and it was just for him easier to say okay rather than have the headache and stress in america farmers are quite stressed right now yes yes yeah and uh, another, another 
thing to think about if you couldn't initially obtain the land outside it's to work with those that want to establish something if if you've all got I mean, i'm not sure what your your uh, setup is but over here in england many houses have large back gardens so you can establish like a small holding in your back garden fruit and vegetables chickens and, and things like that um and you work it with the local so that's authority. what we're doing right now like for example i'm growing something in my house okay and we're also growing something at the masjid right and all of that is to kind of like and and like i have never grown anything this is like the first time i'm doing it okay. right and uh, in fact uh, I, I don't know what type of uh uh problem I have in, in my head, but when I first put in the seeds and the water and everything, I was scared to go back out because it says, you know, after 10 days, it's supposed to sprout. So I was scared to come and see if anything came out or not, because I was like so scared. What if it didn't come out? But alhamdulillah, some of it came out, not all of it came out. Uh, what do you think about seeds, uh, gathering seeds? Because I really, you know, I, I went to the, I went to the store and I bought a bunch of seeds, a bunch of things for the masjid, for my house. And then I came to find out that these seeds don't produce seeds. Some of the things that I bought, they're like, I, I could think they're called hybrids here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh darn, what was the use of buying a watermelon if it's not going to give me the seeds <laughs> to, to produce watermelon? Um, one thing I want to ask your opinion about, somebody said this to me and I want to know what you think is, is that when we're eating, whatever we're eating at home, like we buy grapes from the store, but just to collect all the seeds. Yes. Would that work? Yes. Like even if it's yes. 10 years later, it'll still work? Yeah, you can try, yeah. And the other thing you can do is just go to, you know, what people do here, you go, if you know a, a neighbor is, planting strawberries or apple trees or whatever it is, just go to them and say, you know, when you produce your crop, can I, can I, you know, can I take your seeds? Uh -huh. Go to the local allotment, you build up a good relationship with them and just say, I'm, I'm, I'm starting up a small holding here, bring them to your house, show them the land, build up a good relationship and say, look, you know, can you help me? Can I take some of your seeds? And then you know that, you know, that seed is, is organic. You know the source rather than keep going to the supermarket where we just don't know where half the fruit that we're eating today never even grows from the soil. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, okay. you know, just start to network in your local communities. But the, the other thing to be aware about, and I know Sheikh Imran Hussein mentioned it years back, is that you know, we have to be careful if we're going to live off, off grid as a Muslim community, then that's going to send all the alerts out to authorities. Oh, you know, what's happening? What are they doing? Why are they together? Are they planning? And that's why there is a lot of discussion there. And, and I think you've mentioned it as well about perhaps living with other people from different faiths. Um, uh, and I think Dr. Omar, yes, in your talk with him yesterday, right. he even mentioned about taking your children to live with the, the you know, uh, tribes, the, the Red Indian tribes. Right. So I think we have to be careful of, is there a risk factor that's totally isolating ourselves in the, in the remote countryside? Right, right. Good point, good point. Um, if we can get together with, like Amish, for example, uh, people that have the experience and they're good Christians, like for example, yes. right? They're practicing Christians yes. and uh, they are uh, practicing their scriptures. Then we have a moral basis on which we can cooperate, right? And, and the jail is an enemy to them as much as it would be for us. Exactly. And so, so that would be the bigger, you know, threat that would, that would further enhance our, uh, getting along with one another. Um, so, yeah, so we've started these small personal ventures and at the masjid level ventures. Um, and, 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 you know, we're looking to buy a proper land. Uh, what type, what are the things that we need to, uh, so, so water would be one of the things, right? That, what about fishing? With, because in this area where I am, there's a lot of 
fishing places. Okay. That's something that we need to should train ourselves into in doing fishes. Yes. Whether it's uh, cause fishing, you know, using the floats, or it's by fly fishing and you know salmon fishing. So we need to educate our our communities about fishing. Uh, mm. And also over here, which is my my role, is I'm also a uh, falconer, obviously with the birds of prey. Mm. So I know that you have the North American uh, falconry association. So and I know that's allowable in our religion where you're you're taking trained hawks and falcons to go out and catch prey okay so let's talk about that since that's like obviously one of your expertise expertise uh is that something hard to do to train a no. falcon to no, no. like you um, yeah i've seen those movies where the falcon's sitting on your arms and then he you know goes and gets the prey Yes, and, and brings it to you. How how would they like? What do you need for something like that? That would be like pretty interesting. Is that something we should explore? Yes, I mean you, you know it's something that I'm trying to work hard over here because our Muslim communities just are not understanding about birds of prey and we in the olden days used it all the time. Yeah, yeah. So nowadays, I mean you know you, okay. So you've got your crossbow, you've got your fishing, you've got your your uh, guns but the natural way is 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 your 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 training birds of prey which and there's so many captive breeding programs now and there's so many in america uh in north america that um you can purchase the birds of prey that are captive bred so and obviously it's like a gun license you have to have a license you have to be approved and trained up uh, and that that's straightforward in america and there's different species of hawk and falcon that you can have and then you just basically, again, which is good, it connects to the working off grid. Is so instead you, of you having a drone <laughs> out there, well, you know, you have these falcons. Uh, what about like pigeons for sending messages like they used to in the olden days? Is that in what way? Uh, not so much messages, but I say, um, uh, I mean, that the whole idea of the actual falcon is that you're, you're taking it out into the remote countryside and it's either just you and the bird or maybe you have a, a working dog okay or if you're going to hunt rabbits and uh, ferrets and so you're working with that relationship and you're and you're you're just out there hunting prey mm. uh, and then bringing it back and giving some to the bird some to the dog and then you're putting the rest into your no uh, fridge i mean so many falconers over here who i also train they also make a business because then they're selling fresh game to the butchers right right okay so you got pheasant you got partridge you got rabbit and so many people now want that taste of fresh you know fresh game mm -hmm. and as long as it's done in the halal way then alhamdulillah right right so um so you got your dogs that can do hunting for you. You got your falcons that can do hunting for you. So that, that's actually increasing because I was just thinking about personal arrows and stuff. <laughs> uh, but okay, I understand now. So that, how long does it take to learn about how to train one of these falcons to do um, hunting? To become well established, probably it would take well, if you want to become really well established, it's a good two or three years. But if you're with a if you're with a, a good professional falconer, he he can have you up and running with a, a hawk after about six months. Six. Months. Once you know what you're doing, from taking the bird from captivity and training the bird up from the aviary, you can have that bird flying in about six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks, wow. and that bird will live with you. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a pet, it's, a, it's a, a working machine, but that bird, you know, will live with you maybe up to 15, 20 years. Oh, wow. Mashallah. Yeah. 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 So would you say like uh, each family has its own falcon or hawk? Yes. If, if you've got the land and, 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 and you can work with the local farmers, and the farmers probably would want to work with you because they would say, okay, so they class rabbits and other things as pests. Hmm. So again, that's a good working relationship. So, you know, you, you 
you you can go onto their land and maybe that's where you start to do some business so you know he might have some seeds and then you start to right ex exchange and so you just right. build up and the more land you have then yes obviously then uh the more birds of prey that you can you can have and then take them out and on top of that behind all of this it's about education completely you know continually educating our our youth about nature about wildlife about the importance okay okay yeah and that can be exciting for the kids too i hope uh just the whole um getting in touch with wildlife and uh okay and so okay so we got uh we got water um we learn fishing now each one of these things like learning fishing uh learning uh how to make honey the beehives uh do do they what type of skill level do you need for are, are is there like a medium skill level for these things or or or, or not or each thing is different i mean to become a a beekeeper i mean most beekeeping courses over here is about six weeks and once you know the actual basics the whole idea of beekeeping is that you just establish the hive and once you know what you're doing you just go inside the hive just once a week the, the, the main thing of a beekeeper shake is you make sure that the queen has enough space to lay her eggs mm. the beekeeper has to make sure that the the hive is not going to swarm if you swarm, then you're going to lose your hive, and then you lose your capital. Hmm. So the whole idea of a beekeeper is just he's visiting the hive once a week. He's making sure he can see the queen. And then once you're in full production, you're just taking off so many frames each week to take off the honey. Right. Making sure that there's enough for you, and you're giving some back as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what other birds like uh, do you think would be important like ducks uh, I know you mentioned quails so yes. let's talk about uh, you know so it, will they be able to live side by side like the falcon and the quails and, and no, you, need, you, 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 you need to keep them separate because the, the birds of prayer class is the top of the food chain hmm. So if you if you know if you're out and about and you hear any commotion in the sky or other birds calling, that's probably because above them is a, a bird of prey. So so they are the dominant thing in the sky. So you, you need to keep that separate. But certainly duck eggs, that's a big seller for uh, butchers, uh, and also geese and also geese. the goose eggs. But also geese are excellent uh, guard dogs. Oh okay yeah 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 i can assure you if you had two or three geese as guard dogs no one would come anywhere near the the uh, farm oh really wow yeah. interesting yeah. yeah so you've got chicken eggs quail your duck eggs and uh and uh, geese uh goose eggs and oh, that's just the eggs and then you've got your meat production as well hmm. but as i said to you if if uh you know the the Particularly for the or the Oriental restaurants that may be in your locality, and the French restaurants, there's a massive need for for quail meat hmm. and quail eggs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what are other things that we're looking for in terms of the land? Uh, I mean, can it be? Can we take uh, like dirt cheap land that doesn't have, let's say, a lot of greenery and convert it into greenery? Do we just put topsoil? Like, can we like take a land that is no good and cheap for someone who's out there and he's like, well, I don't got one hundred fifty thousand dollars and I don't have friends who, let's say, fifteen friends that each put in ten thousand dollars and we get this big land. Uh, you know, let's say I have only five thousand dollars. Can I buy land for five thousand and then put topsoil there and try to grow something? Is that yes, you can. Yes, you, yeah, yeah, you you uh, can do that. And also, if the soil is not not you know adequate, you can also put the plant beds in. So you you you're actually putting the wooden beds in. So you're planting your fruit and your and your vegetables in the plant beds with the 
uh, soil. But the other type of farming to think about, and, and it's too long to go through now, and, and it's important for us as Muslims, is uh, permaculture. Okay. Per, per, uh, permaculture farming. Okay. Well, so can you explain what that is? It's just it, it's it's working uh, without the pesticides. Okay. Yes. 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 That sort of stuff. But it, it's it's working. So whatever land that you've got, it's working with with, 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 with within the actual the natural patterns that's a, around the land. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, so it's you know, so with, you're looking at your land and seeing. Okay. What what is it? This land. How can this land work? Yes, yeah, yeah. Rather than the normal commercial farmer today where he's taken the land and he's completely changing it around and he's working it year after year after year and the soil has been eroded. So permaculture farming is just taking that land and trying to see how it would normally live um, uh, naturally and just working with the land. Hmm. Yeah. Working with the land as it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and not like trying to make it into a, a land that it's not. No, no. And the other type of farming, which is taken off here, is I can't think of the name of the farm, but there's a number of books now on it. It's um, a lot of um, people are working with um, where they plant their crops according to the cycle of the, the uh, cycles of the moon. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all of their farming is, is worked on the lunar uh, calendar. It, it's, a, it's a type of farming. It's taken off big time here in the UK, but I just can't think of the, of the, of, of the name. But the, the whole farming throughout the whole year is based on the cycles of the moon. It's based off of the cycles of the moon. So uh, let's talk about uh, the, the yearly schedule, because I know... I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but fruits only come out and, and harvest only comes out in certain times of the year, correct? Yes. What are we doing in the other times where we're kind of like plowing the land and stuff, but we don't have harvest yet? So at that time where let's say, let's say I'm stuck, uh, the jad is in the city, I'm at home. Okay, so I got my hens or quails, they're gonna give me my eggs. I'm not necessarily interested in killing them for meat uh, unless I have to, I guess. But can I survive on milk from a goat and eggs from a quail? Would, would that? Yes, I mean, I mean obviously. I probably the best life in the world, but I mean, if I'm talking about surviving, yeah. uh, what is the minimum? Uh, like I'm just asking uh, this, like let me, my, my my kids. What is the minimum? I'm. It, 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 will I be able to survive on milk and eggs? Is that good enough? Yes. And you got your honey. Okay, honey. Yeah. How yeah. important is it to have honey? Very important. Very, Very important. Particularly the natural honey, which is the comb, which you're just taking. So you 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 you're eating the 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 honey with the beeswax with the pollen, with the raw jelly, it's just mm. fresh, you know, but you're fresh from the hive. But mm. that, just going back to your other question, because yes, so, you know, you have to make sure, and you, this is where you have to sit down with some experts is, okay, so what vegetables are we going to sow? What fruit are we going to sow? So you make sure that you establish the, the types of fruit and vegetable uh, uh, and, uh, you know, veg, that's going to sprout throughout the whole year. Summer, spring, you get your autumn fruit, you get your winter fruit as well. So you, you've got something that you know that's coming throughout the year. Um, so then you, again, you go on to your quail production. So, okay, so I don't want to eat them as meat, but I can still make money. And that's a quick turnover because you know that the incubation of the quail egg is only 14 days. So you've got a quick uh okay. turn over there so there's so many ways that you can think and okay so when you're not out on the land you're also preparing so you're you're preparing the land for the spring uh or you're pruning the uh fruit bushes for, for the next crop 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's so much going on that, and, and you know, it depends on your skill suit, uh, you, uh, your uh, skill set. You could have experts in woodcraft. So if you had a whole community, how would you, let's say you had a group of 50, 60 brothers, uh, and, and, and would you say that, uh, okay, two of you are going to do this, and that's your expertise, and two or five of you will do this, and that's your expertise. Yes. <coughs> so, so, so you would kind of like, or, or would it have to be like, there have to be some people who know a little bit of everything, just in case, and then you have the people that do that. How would you organize a jama? uh that would take on this venture uh, definitely you use your expertise so if you've got those that that, that, that are experts in falconry or you know sheep farming or well, like or, right or now that. they're not experts in anything they're just no. all one of these okay right uh, so that's why at the moment because you know we we know that the state of the ummah and the communities where there's so much infighting and the last thing we want to do is to have a a, a, a small holding where we got infighting. So I think at this stage, shape, you need to reach out to them and say, "What what what would you like to specialize in?" Okay. And then to get them qualified in that speciality, whether it's you know chickens, uh, uh, cows, you know dairy farming or whatever. So try and get them to specialize, try and get as many qualifications and get them focused in, in, in so each one is, is qualified in a particular area. And then those that are just sort of, well, I'm, I'm happy to help here and there, then you can use them to, to just fill in the gaps. But you need, you know, you need to decide, okay, so this is the land that we've got. What are we going to grow? What um, animals are we going to have? And what exp what expertise do we have? None. Okay. So what courses are available, and what do you want to learn? Mm-hmm. And then go and be qualified. Hmm. Now, if you have a whole community working on this, how let's say we don't have how long will it take for the community on average? Let's say if you have fifty people and you divide. Okay, look, you're going to do this, and and this person, you're going to raise the quails, and you're going to learn how to hunt with the falcon. Uh, how much time would it take for, would you say that for a community to um, learn and then start maybe getting mid-level uh, efficient? I mean, the course is- How much time of preparation is, is yeah. basically what I'm asking. I mean, obviously what you've got to take in to consideration okay so you, you find the land and you're having to build all your accommodation uh, everything but you know to be up and running to look after quail or birds of prey or dairy farming and sheep most courses that i work on over here um most courses are between sort of six and 12 weeks and once you've got that you're you're qualified enough as long as you still have a, a mentor you're qualified enough and capable of taking a small flock of sheep or goats or honeybees and actually starting up something yourself as long as you've got a mentor there that you can turn to. Right. So a mentor and finances. Yeah. So yeah. those are going to be the two, two big keys. You need to find a mentor for your expertise within the village. Yes. And uh, okay. So what about building a hut or like how would we live? I mean, I'm talking about this, the house, the actual house. So now there's many of these. Uh, is there a cheapest way or a, a standard way of, of, of how houses are out, would be out in the farm at this point? The cheapest method that people are using over here is they're using these, uh, we call it static caravans. These big mobile st- static the caravans. Mobile homes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they come in all forms, you know. Uh, right. Right. You have the double wide, you have the, in the US, they, they come in different forms. Yes. Yeah. So everything is inside. All the pipeline, all the uh, pipes is there. Everything is there. And, you know, it's, it's 
big business now and you know that you 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 just pay for one it comes to your land and they just put it down they they connect all the electricity and the pipes and you you're up and running mm. but obviously if you want to establish you know your own eco village or eco house then you know it depends how much money and time you want to put into it i know some of the eco villages up towards scotland um i mean some of the houses there are, are very nice but obviously you know extremely expensive but a lot of the eco villages in the south of the uk they're using these uh, portable uh mobile homes hmm. uh what is your advice in terms of security then yeah that's 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 the actual biggest issue um and i know as i say shaking man hussein was covering this uh and i i don't really have an answer for that because that's that's my only worry and concern is um how do you protect yourself how do you um, protect yourself yeah yeah uh because uh I mean, the Ashabul Kahaf, the seven sleepers, they had the dog, right? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, say you've got your dogs, you can have your uh, dogs, you can have the geese. Uh, that's all there. And then you obviously, you know, it's important for our day and age uh, that we learn how to protect ourselves. And I mentioned, I know you've mentioned it a few times in your previous videos about learning, you know, self-defense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we try and do everything within our power, um, and then you establish. There is a saying of the Prophet, uh, which uh, I'd like to share with the Prophet: uh, "If not, uh, if not, Asha alafin la yaglibu min al qilla." The Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a people of twelve hundred ala amrin wahid." He said, "Oh, on one affair, meaning they have a jamaa, will not be overcome by lack of numbers." Mm -hmm. So now I don't know if you can establish a big village of 12,000 people. That would be humongous, humongous. Um, but the prophet is 12,000 people cannot be overcome. Now, I don't know if that's something to take into consideration in terms of actual meaning. When the prophet said it, did he say it for a specific circumstance or in general? Or are there exceptions? Like is the Jal an exception to that statement, for example? So, um, but in general, uh you know um that's what the prophet said and so uh i'm looking forward to uh see if we can grow this to 12000 people because at least that will give me the contentment of knowing all right and this is what the prophet said <laughs> but you know only that happens which allah wants so um okay so I think doing these projects will also be good for the iman of our kids. Meaning, in terms yes. of, uh, in terms of, I mean, y y you uh, deal with the wildlife, uh, and 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 so, how has that brought you closer to Allah? Very close. I was I was just going to say that, you know, the key word today is about sustainability and the environmental crisis. But it doesn't matter, this is just from experience after all these years. It doesn't matter what, what you do, you're not going to change anyone individually or com a community until that person is connected wholly to the natural world. Hmm. Once they understand, yeah, yeah, you know, the natural world is important, I'm actually in love with nature, I want to be part of it um that's the first step and that's that's why what i've done i mean i've i've found since becoming muslim many years ago shakers i continually hit my head against the brick wall i'm trying to reach out to the to the muslim communities to the scholars even to the uh, daralooms and the institutes why are we not teaching our children um about the importance of nature hmm so many ayats in the Quran yes, yes. about the importance of the natural world and for me so as a biologist it wasn't till after I became Muslim I mean I was lost for words about how many verses in the Quran are connected with nature Absolutely. it wasn't it wasn't until later 
and for many reasons, um, I started to, 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 to see the dots and I started to connect the dots uh, and, and, and see everything connected. And I know many scholars in the past and many contemporary scholars where you know, they talk about where there's two revelations. There's the revelation of the Quran and then there's the revelation of the book of the universe. So the, the book of the universe came first. Uh, and I'm learning it as well because, you know, I'm in my third year of my Alim course. So I'm still in the Arabic stage, you know, where your ism and your halaf and your, <laughs> and, and your verbs, where you're learning to connect everything. So how do we, how, you know, how we read the Quran is the same way as how we should read the natural world. That's right. And my, my thinking is, and you know, they didn't I, have that gap in the time of the prophet because they're in the desert. They're in the natural world, right? Uh, they were just missing the, the, the nur of the Quran, so to say, but they were connected with nature already. Exactly. Uh, our problem is we're not connected with both. Uh, and, and so what, so what I, I try and do over here, I, I run sort of what we call is outdoor madrasas. So I take children. Muslim children into the natural world, and I and I, I I connect them like I start with the tree. So I start with the twig and the branch and the leaves, and then I connect. I deal with the things that you can't see, like the roots, and then you put a whole tree together, and then I start to talk about the ayats of the Quran that mention trees, and then put it all together. Then suddenly they start to connect with the tree, and then that then they start to fall in love with the tree. Mm -hmm. and, and they see the purpose and then we start to explore the stars and, and the clouds and we start to bring everything to life so then they 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 connect i, I mean i remember when i graduated from the imam khatib course sheikh the principal as that said to me he said you can be here three years to do the imam khatib course four years you can become a mufti here you can become an alim but if you've left the Dalaloom and you haven't recognized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hmm. recognized, then you've just wasted your time. Right. Yes. So, you know, me as a biologist, you know, for me personally, I'm I my focus is on contemplation. Hmm. You know, to connect with the natural world. So you see a flower. So you see a flower, it's beautiful, but then you start to see it not just with your eyes, as you know, Shaykh, you start to see it with your heart. Hmm. And then you start to get closer and closer and closer. And then you you start not just to see the flower, but you start to see the ecosystem around. Mm. And then you start to see the, the whole system. And then mm. you start to see Tawheed. And then you start to see the names of Allah in the whole universe. And then you start to, you start to be able to read. You're, you're reading the natural world, just like you do uh, when you read the, the uh, Quran. So mm. that's, what, that's what I'm trying to do. And to me, for me, that's the first stage that we have to do before we can even think about, for me, establishing the small holdings, working off uh, grid. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've got to have that connection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, yes, so you can set up a small holding off grid. But obviously, you know, our, our families have young children and they're going to be the ones, inshallah ta'ala, that will continue with this. So they've got to be really connected so they aren't influenced by the system of the the jail so they think well you know i'm hearing that, 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 that answers a very important question what you just said in my mind which was why would the amish stay in the natural world and i think part of the answer is it's very lovely you fall in love with it yes you know uh, somebody that's living in the cities is thinking like what why would they want to be there but being in that environment Allah has created, it's just, uh, there's a certain magnetism. Uh, maybe that's the wrong word, but you're just attracted to it. Yes. Right? And, and, and uh, like subhanAllah. So if we can get our kids attracted to nature, they will find their, their way into, into nature and protecting themselves. And, and, and I think uh, the, the big, so that's a big takeaway. Right, that that you have to uh, begin to study the uh, the way I had understood it in my mind. Uh, you said it a little bit differently. Is that you have the re revealed knowledge, 
and you have uh, this creation, which is also the word of Allah, because it's still kun fayakun, right? Be and it is. And, uh, and, and so the Quran is the word of Allah, and this creation is the word of Allah. Yes. And, uh, and, and so, and what's interesting is when Allah says, Ikra, bismi rabbika, ladhi khalaq, right? Read in the name of your Lord who created. So this like connection between the Quran, here right, Ikra, and the takhliq, the, the creation of Allah, this is like in absolutely, absolutely integral. Uh, and I think uh, even though you can appreciate the Quran without the natural world, but I think for the companions of the Prophet, the experience that they had, probably a big part of it was the ayat of Quran dealing with nature because they were in nature, right? Let and, me ask you a question, Sheikh. I just want to get your thoughts just quickly. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there's a tree that represents a believer. Mm. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention the name of the tree. So am I, I'm correct in saying, am I, that there's the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he says it's the palm tree. Right. Yes. So how, how, how I teach that to children, and correct me if I'm wrong, so Allah, I mean, further along the line, he says that there's a tree that's like a, a disbeliever. I'm, my thinking was from the hadith that the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, is asking the companions as a tree that represents a believer. And so young Abdullah, uh, he knows the tree. And, and so then, but he's too nervous to say it. And then the Prophet of Allah says, hey, it's the palm tree. And I could just imagine, rightly or wrongly, that all the companions after that would have rushed to the palm tree to look to to look at it and touch it. Right, and think, wow. Exactly. Yes. Like what's special about this tree? What does it have? And you know, what are the parts of this tree? And that, that, I mean, I don't think, I don't see any classical texts that come to my mind that have actually dived into uh, the palm tree other than I have read that every aspect of the palm tree can be used like every, but I'm sure that's true with many other trees, but that, that would be interesting. Uh, something to look, look into, but you're absolutely right. So, you know, but this is also a, an example of how the prophet was connected to nature. Yes. Long, yes. Right. And, and how uh, that when he had to give an example, he gave examples from nature many, many times, right? Yes. yes. Like he wouldn't shake the tree for, in the case of Wudu, for example. Uh, and so uh, there are seven metaphors that are used in the Quran over and over again, like darkness to light is one metaphor. The tree is another metaphor, like the agriculture, the tree is one of the major metaphors. I, now that I'm thinking about it, I think majority of the metaphors have to do with nature in the Quran. And uh, so that, that's, that's uh, very interesting. So yeah. And it, makes, it makes me think as well, Sheikh is uh, in the Seerah of the Prophet, peace be where uh, it was it was the culture when they were born the newborn in Mecca that the the wet nurses used to take him in, in, into the desert right yes for that for, to, to be connected so they weren't polluted with from the society so you could just imagine as well uh, our our messenger peace point him he would have grown up with that beautiful or, or organic milk you know uh, that, that wholesome milk in that natural environment. And then as he developed into a teenager, he became a sheep farmer, a uh, shepherd. Yes. So that natural connection to the, nat to the uh, natural world. Yeah, absolutely. So this, this ad adventure or venture to build a Muslim village uh, has different layers. One layer has to do with connecting with Allah, recognizing Allah. And another layer has to do with protecting uh, the seed or the future of Islam. And then, uh, and then, you know, third is, you know, that you can actually establish a, a, an example, a model of Medina, where people can see and say, oh, this is what justice is like. And this yes. is how people should live. And this is how people should interact. And this is the natural way to solve problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate that. So, but the, my big takeaways, uh, so that my viewers would be clear on this, is this, number one, 
you have to know what are the courses available in your area. Yes. So you have yes. to meet that. Okay. Yes. Number two, uh, w uh, getting connected with nature will inshallah connect us more closer to Allah. This process itself, because you know, if once you get in the process and you're dealing with the quails, you're dealing with the plants, you're dealing with the creation of Allah directly, um, that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing you said that's very important to me because I wasn't thinking in that way, because I was thinking of sustainability as in just self sustainability. But looking at the the ayah of, of the Ashab al Kahf and how they were also going into the city, it's worth, if you're doing it, then you have to think bigger for two reasons. Number one, somebody from the outside might want to join your, uh, your, your village, but also now you have something to bargain with, with somebody in the city. And you're going to have something with you that they don't have in the city. They have that, 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 bad meat that the judge is trying to give them, right? The, the process. Exactly, yes. and, 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 yes. and so, um, and, and another thing that I learned is that if you become serious, you can begin to train each course in, let's say, a course of 12 weeks. So that's about four months, right? For a 12, three to four months. So if you can spread out the responsibility. The other thing that I learned from you that was very important is about the importance of birds in this. The falcon. I mean, if yes. I had a falcon that can hunt for me, wow, I'm a lucky person, you know. And uh, and then uh, another thing that you raised that was an important question was this issue of security. Yes. Uh, that uh, allowing or either joining people of other faiths that are strong in their faith and have good morals mm -hmm. is uh, something to seriously think about uh, under the circumstances. Yes. Um, and, uh, or, and, you know, just uh, to keep thinking about that. The, the other thing that you mentioned, which is important was, uh, the housing, the housing, the housing, uh, to me is important because I was thinking, okay, we're going to buy this land and, uh, you know, the farming idea, I get it, the fishing and all that, but where are we going to live? So you're saying that we should just buy these ready-made, uh, places and just place them there yeah uh, and then at least you have that as your foundation and then as inshallah as you develop and you've got income coming in then as a community you you can think about expanding out into your own you know right right okay so inshallah ta'ala so um when can we have you again <laughs> whenever you've got time shake your Extremely busy, alhamdulillah. Yes, alhamdulillah, I am busy, but uh, I would definitely like to continue this conversation. Um, and, and even in the conversation we had, I want to maybe uh, talk uh, a little bit more, inshallah ta'ala. But um, if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to are gonna want to ask you questions. So I'll be in touch with you about that. Uh, Inshallah. Okay, so inshallah, assalamu alaikum. Uh, right. um, end for today, inshallah. Here, I've I've had a lot of complaints that my interviews go on too long, too long, too long. You know, when I first started interviewing Dr. Omar, right, they used to be like forty minutes. Yeah. And then uh, now my recent ones are like one hour twenty minutes, and uh, one hour is has become the new average. But I think I'm gonna push back to forty minutes. Uh, because that's generally what the, the time span most people have. So, inshallah. So, we'll be in touch and uh, we're going to need your guidance. And uh, I will need your guidance. Um, in fact, as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to send this off even before YouTube to uh, a group of brothers I know that would be uh, interested in knowing what you have to say. Okay, sure. Inshallah. Okay, assalamu <laughs> Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas.